If you have your Bible, you want to turn with me, I'm going to be in Romans chapter 12 today. Romans chapter 12. A couple of those verses are very familiar to many of us, I know. Let you find Romans chapter 12. I'm not a user, but I'm told that there's a setting on Facebook pertaining to your personal status. You can let it be known whether or not you're currently in a relationship. I suppose that that indicates that if you're in a relationship, you're unavailable to others for any romantic relationship. Well, if you're a believer, and I take it if you're here tonight, you're probably a believer. If you're a believer, you're in a relationship. And you are in an exclusive relationship. A relationship that is serious and a relationship that is permanent. But you know, whatever the relationship that you or I are in, relationships always carry certain responsibilities with them. And that is completely applicable in our relationship with the Lord. It is chock full of responsibility. And I want to share three of them with you right here in Romans chapter 12. As we think about this subject, are you in a relationship? Let's pause for prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you might just use these uh, verses and this text that we will just think on briefly tonight, mightily in our lives. We pray that your word would go forth, not in word only, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that you might Target our hearts to accomplish what you want to see done in our lives as we listen to and as we become doers of your word. Make us doers of the word. Lord, show us simple truth yet impactful in our hearts, we pray. We just thank you for Jesus. It's all because of him. And we're his servants, and we want to do his will tonight and in the days going forward. So we want to honor and glorify Jesus in everything and pray it in his name. Amen. Now, I hope that you'll be able to stay awake tonight. Uh, I know that by the end of the daylight and you sit down, maybe this is the first time you sat down all day. I don't know. But stick with me, will you? I see some, some heavy eyelids already. That's why I'm stressing this, okay? Don't go to sleep on me. Uh, I'm going to sit down. Verse number one in Romans chapter 12. Are you familiar with this one? I'm sure you are. This is a great verse it, where Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, he says, which is your reasonable service. I began by saying that if you are in a relationship with the Lord, there are responsibilities that you have, and here is a big one. I would sum up verse 1 as simply saying that you and I have first and foremost a responsibility as believers to be in surrender to the Lord. I know you hear that a lot, but I believe that what we have in this uh, 12th chapter of Romans is really a progressive development in a believer's relationship with the Lord. And the development of your relationship with God is built upon this foundation of surrender. It's the first step, you might say. A life, a relationship with God develops when it begins with a total surrender of yourself to him. And by that, I mean no strings attached. You say, God, here I am. 
I'm no longer my own. You've purchased me with your precious blood. And so you own all that there is of me and everything that pertains to me. And I have uh, no will but yours. That's what I mean by surrender. Well, why? I mean, what's the basis for surrender? Well, he says in that first verse, it's your reasonable service. He's not asking you to do anything that is unreasonable. Why? Is it your reasonable service to surrender all that you are to the Lord? He says it in that first verse. Look at it. Because of the mercies of God. This is why surrender is uh, our responsibility. Because of all the mercies of God that you and I are the recipients of. Have you stopped recently to think about the various mercies of God that uh, he's made available to you? Well, I think perhaps he's talking about the chapters that uh, preceded chapter 12. I mean, the first three chapters of the book of Romans, he tells us what guilty sinners we are. And it's like, no hope. And then in chapters four and five, He tells us how that our sins have been dealt with by Jesus' death and resurrection and his shed blood so that we're justified by faith. And then in chapter 6, 7, and 8, he talks about how as justified believers we can live holy, victorious, godly Christian lives. All that provision, all of those mercies, how God sees us in Christ and not in our uh, sinful state. And based upon those mercies, that's why we surrender. Well, I want to look a little closer at this. What do we surrender? Um, He says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies. You surrender your bodies to the Lord. And I believe this rabbi or former rabbi, I should say, that's writing these words under the inspiration of the Spirit, must in his mind be referring to the voluntary burnt offering in the Old Testament, that when that burnt offering was offered, the whole animal was offered. And so he's saying, I want you to offer yourself, your whole self, with no part missing not reserving anything for yourself. I want you to offer your whole self to me. That's what he means when he says your body, your whole self. Well, how do you do that? Well, as the Old Testament worshiper, they would bring an unblemished animal to the priest They'd hand that animal over to the priest, and the priest would kill that animal, would sacrifice it, would lift it up and place it on the altar so that that animal's body would be completely consumed by fire. To offer yourself as a living sacrifice is that you, functioning as a New Testament priest, and by the way, we're called priests and kings unto God, as a New Testament priest, What you do is you hand yourself completely over to God and you're all in for anything that he has for you. You hand yourself over to be totally consumed by the will of God, by whatever Jesus asks of you. That's how. So this responsibility in this relationship that we're in with God begins with surrender. But look at what the next step is. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed or shaped to this world, but be transformed. And that means to be changed from the inside. That word transformed as it, uh, there means to be uh, metamorphosized be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind. 
The second uh, part of our responsibility in this relationship with God begins with surrender, but the next thing is to saturate. (laughs) That's what he's talking. Your whole mind, all of your thinking is to be saturated with God's thinking, and you get God's thinking in God's word. So your whole mind, your thinking, saturated with the Word of God. You know, the natural way in which we think is the way the world thinks. And the way the world thinks is it puts yourself in the center of everything. Worldly natural thinking is self-centered. And that's why we are told we need our thinking renewed. (laughs) We need the mind of Christ. That's what it means to have your mind renewed. You need the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is totally different from the way that we think. We are told in Philippians 2, 5, that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what kind of a mind did he have? It was an absolutely self-sacrificing way of thinking. And that's the mind that we need. That's the thinking that that's what we have to be saturated with that kind of thinking. For Paul says in that passage, let nothing be done through strife or out of pride for vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let every believer value others as being more important than themselves and stop focusing on yourself and your own things and start focusing on the, the how you can be a blessing and meet the needs of others. That's the mind of Christ who thought it not robbery with God, uh, thought it not robbery uh, to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, emptied himself of the independent use of all of these attributes that he had as God and was made in the form of a man, made in the likeness of man, made in the form of a servant, and then becomes obedient to the death of the cross. That is the mind of Christ. And that's the renewing of the mind, not being conformed to the way the world thinks, which is self-centered, but rather the way Jesus thinks, which is others-centered. Not to live for ourselves, but to live for the Lord and for others. That's transformed thinking. It's not what is in it for me. It's not what do I get out of it, but how can I be a blessing to other people? How can I serve God? How can I bless other people? The very uh, that that then very naturally leads to a life which I think is the next progressive step in our relationship and our responsibility. We begin with surrender and then saturate, and then that leads to service. And that's really what he's talking about here when he says in the second part of verse uh, two that you may prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. And uh, he goes on uh, through this passage to talk about how we are to be servants of the Lord. He says in verse 11, for example, that we are not to be slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Listen to me. I don't think that any believer is properly uh, ready to serve the Lord until, first of all, they are surrendered and they are saturated. And I've already explained what I meant by that, what this means by that. Because these are the ways when we surrender to the Lord and only when we surrender to him and only when we saturate our minds with the thinking, the the mind of Christ, only then will God unfold his purpose for your life. You know, if you're, however old you are, if you're still wondering, I wonder what God wants me to do. It just tells me two things. 
you haven't surrendered to the Lord and your mind is not saturated with the mind of Christ. I tell young people when they're all bugged out, and there's not too many that really care, I, I, I hate to say, about discovering God's will for their life, don't worry about it. Just surrender your life to the Lord and just uh, saturate your mind, your heart with the mind of Christ. And as verse 2 says, you will prove out what is the perfect will of God for your life. This is how the will of God for the individual life is made clear. This is how he unfolds it, his purpose for our lives. So this means if you'll totally surrender to God and you'll just focus on knowing him, absorbing his mind, and letting his thinking permeate your thinking, God's will for your life will just flow naturally out of that. And you'll discover what is the perfect will of God for your life. And you will serve him. And you will serve him in several ways. In verse 3, if you have surrendered and saturated, your service for the Lord will be done in humility. See what verse 3 says? Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but soberly. Don't overestimate your the value of yourself. Remember that you and I have no value apart from Jesus. All we are and all of our service for the Lord is only valuable as it is Christ in us moving through us. Humility. Don't overestimate your value. And then here's a second aspect of serving. In verses 4 and 5, we have many members in one body. He's talking about the body of Christ. And all members have not the same office. They don't have the same responsibility. They don't have the same area of service, verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another. One of another. The kind of serving that we will do will not only be serving in humility, but serving in unity. That's what those two verses are about. There will be a mutual appreciation of each other. There will be a, a mutual um, dependency because we share a personal connection with each other because we're all connected in union with Jesus. And so there's a unity, regardless of how different our personalities are, regardless of how different our abilities are that God has given us, that there is that unity. And that's what makes service a blessing when God's people have this unity. But there is another aspect of this, this kind of service. Look at verses 6 to 8, and he names a whole bunch of different areas of service having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, prophecy, uh, verse 7, ministry, uh, verse 7, teaching, uh, verse 8, exhorting or comforting, uh, verse 8, giving, uh, verse uh, 8, ruling or administrating, overseeing, uh, verse 8 again, mercy or compassion. These are all different areas of ability. When you have surrendered to the Lord, and when you are saturated with his thinking, your service will not only be done in humility and unity, it will be done in ability that God gives you. These are God-given abilities. In fact, there is no giftedness that is not graciously given. Whether it be uh, an intellectual level that uh, a person achieves, or something as, uh, as simple as the ability to uh, work with your hands as a craftsman. There is no giftedness that is not graciously given. And so as a result, our abilities are not 
that does not allow us room for pride because we don't have anything that we possess that God hasn't graciously given and gifted us with. If you're wowed by any particular ability in any human being, you must realize that those human beings didn't get that on their own. God gifted them that ability. And in serving the Lord, we have different gifts, different uh, abilities, but it's God's grace that grants them. And then there's another area of serving. It will not only be in humility and unity and uh, and ability that God gives, of course, but it'd be in reality. Look at verses 9 and 10. Let love be without dissimulation. That's a big word that means without hypocrisy. Let it be real. Let your love be real. Abhor that, hate that which is evil, cleave or cling to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Prefer others before yourself. Stop the hypocrisy is what he's saying here. Let your your love be real. Really, genuinely love and honor others, one another. And then there's a final uh, characteristic, I would say, of this kind of of serving. And uh, We've already read six to eight. Look at verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, um, uh, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. I'm going to stop there. Here's the, here's the characteristic of a surrendered, saturated servant of God. Not only humility and unity and ability that God gives in reality, not hypocrisy, but enthusiastically, fervent in spirit. Whether you're serving, whether you're teaching, whether you're encouraging, do it all well. If if your ability is giving, give generously. If your gift is leadership, lead seriously. If your gift is showing kindness, do it gladly. Serve fervently, serve eagerly, serve enthusiastically. By the way, did you know that the word enthusiastic, the derivation of that word means to to have God in you? In God, enthusiastically? That's what it means. And it really applies here. So, are you in a relationship What kind of a relationship is it that you have with the Lord? Is it surrendered? Have you saturated your thinking with the thinking of the Lord? And if so, then that step of serving will be evident in your life and in these ways that we've just quickly looked at. Robert Morrison, he had been a young Scottish man that studied accounting when God saved him and called him to the mission field. And when he arrived in the country of China and the Chinese learned that he was a missionary, that that's what he was there for, they kicked him out of their country. Well, in those days, uh, people who went to mission fields, they went for their whole life. There was no such thing as a furlough back in that day. So Robert went to a tiny island uh, that was a Portuguese colony off the coast of China by the the name of Macau. And uh, there he, he stayed for a short time. And then he returned to China, but again, he was deported. He picked up a job with the East India um, oh, uh, Company and... Uh, he was an accountant for them, and he worked for, for that company during the day, and at night, he disciplined himself to translate the scriptures into Chinese, and eventually he finished the translation of the entire Bible into Chinese, and later he died on that little island off the coast of China, and for days after his death, there was no agreement on where to bury his body. 
the Chinese didn't want a Christian buried in their cemetery, and the Roman Catholic Portuguese uh, priests were not willing to have him buried, a Protestant buried in their cemetery. Finally, someone negotiated with the Roman Catholic Archbishop who sold one cemetery plot so that they could bury missionary Robert Morrison. Here's a man that was rejected all of his life, even rejected in his death. But he was faithful. Where are those kind of faithful servants today, I wonder? Where are those faithful servants they, that say, whatever God asks, I'll do? Are you one of them? Are you willing? Are you one that is surrendered, that is saturated, and that is serving? Because that's what it means if you're in a relationship with the Lord.